Chapter 9, Introduction to the T-Statistic, Part 3. In this lecture video, I'll walk you through an, an example of how to test a hypothesis using a T-Statistic. So when we conduct a hypothesis test, we're comparing one sample to population mean. So the one sample T-test statistic, assuming the null hypothesis is true, would follow this equation. Now, Remember, the null states that there will be no difference, no change. The treatment is ineffective. And therefore, if we calculate our t-statistic, we would take our sample mean, subtract our population mean, and divide by our estimated standard error. And if the null is true, again, if the null is true, we're saying that there is no treatment effect or no difference between a quasi-independent variable category categories, I should say, the t value would equal zero. So again, visually that means that if there is no mean difference, the population mean here is here, is it there in the center, and if there is no mean difference, the sample mean minus population mean would equal zero, so our t would equal zero, and then regardless of what our estimated standard error is equal to, Let's just make up a number, let's say it's equal to 2, the t value would equal 0. So again, the null says that nothing is happening, and if nothing is happening, we should not see a difference between the sample mean and the population mean. Therefore, if we're computing either our z statistic or our t statistic, the t value would equal 0. Again, we learned about converting our sample means, right, into z-scores, now we're converting to t-values, so t would equal 0 in the center, and that value is representative of the null, so t equal to 0 equals null, right, no change, no difference. The basic experimental situation for using the t-statistic or z-score process is presented here in figure 9.3. It assumes that the population parameter mu is known for the population before treatment. So this is the before treatment population. The purpose of the experiment is to determine whether the treatment has an effect. Now again, remember that we could be just simply testing a difference between a quasi-independent variable. The, for example, the difference between males and females. So I just want to state that so that we don't always think that we are conducting an experiment where we're testing the effect of a treatment. Sometimes we're testing the difference between quasi-independent variable conditions or categories. So again, the purpose of the experiment in this case for this example is to determine whether the treatment has an effect. Note that the population after treatment, that's this group here on the right, that the population parameters are unknown. So we don't know what the population mu is equal to, and we don't know what the variability of that distribution is equal to. The population um, mu for the treated, excuse me, for the untreated group, mu and um, would be given Now our job as researchers and as a way of um, implementing inferential statistics is that we're going to use a sample to test a hypothesis about a population mean. So we're going to administer the treatment. So we're going to use a sample that's going to receive treatment. And given the sample statistics, such as the mean and the standard deviation, we're going to draw conclusions about what the treated population would look like. Now that we've learned the four-step process for conducting a hypothesis test that was presented in Chapter 8, we can use that, those skills and that information to apply it to conducting a t-test. So in this slide, we show the hypothesis testing four-step process, and it's identical to what we saw in Chapter 8. First, we state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, and we need to also um, identify the notation that goes along with the null and the alternative hypothesis, given whether we are testing a one-tailed 
directional hypothesis or two-tailed non-directional. The next step is to locate the critical region using the t-distribution table and degrees of freedom. So again, that's where this test um, differs. In chapter 8, the z-score um, value that determined the critical region was based on alpha and was also based on whether we were conducting a one-tailed or two-tailed test. For t-test, as we learned in the previous video, it's contingent upon that additional variable of degrees of freedom. And degrees of freedom, we learned, is equal to n minus 1. So sample size plays a big role in the t distribution. And it helps us determine what that critical t value will equal um, in the t distribution. We may have two values if it's a non-directional test or one value if it's a directional test. Next, we calculate the t statistic, and now we know that t is equal to m minus mu over the estimated standard error of the mean, and the estimated standard error of the mean is equal to our variance over n, and we take the square root of that quotient. Again, we also recognize that that's the same as saying taking the standard deviation over the square root of n. But this first equation will be the one that's used more readily because, again, as I stated in a previous video, the process of computing standard deviation begins with calculating SS, which leads to variance and then standard deviation. So as one leads to the other, if we calculate variance and can use that in this equation, then there really is no reason to calculate standard deviation. So it's a little bit more efficient. And finally, we draw our conclusions regarding the null hypothesis. Again, the null states nothing is happening, no difference, no change, no effect of treatment, or if we're testing a quasi-independent variable, no difference between the quasi-independent variable conditions. At this point, I'm going to walk you through example 9.1 of the text. In that example, um, is focused on the amount of time infants spend staring at a particular picture. So infants, even newborns, prefer to look at attractive faces compared to less attractive faces, according to some researchers. In this study, infants from one to six days old were shown two photographs of women's faces. Previously, a group of adults had rated one of the faces as significantly more attractive than the other. The babies were positioned in front of a screen on which the photographs were presented. The pair of faces remained on the screen until the baby accumulated a total of 20 seconds of looking at one or the other. The number of seconds looking at the attractive face was recorded for each infant. The number of seconds looking at the attractive face was recorded for each infant. Sorry, I just read that. Suppose that the study used a sample of nine infants and the data produced an average of 13 seconds for the attractive face with SS equal to 72. So at this point, we know a couple of things. So let's identify the givens. We know that we're working with a sample of nine infants. And they produced um, a sample statistic equal to an average equal to 13 seconds and the SS which is a measure of variability was equal to 72. Now we know that we're going to be calculating t-statistic. The t-statistic requires the estimated standard error of the mean which requires or is a function of variance. So we were given SS. Given SS enables us to calculate variance. So let's go ahead and do that now. So variance is equal to SS over N minus 1, or degrees of freedom. SS is equal to 72. Degrees of freedom in this case, again, it's N minus 1. So our sample size is equal to 9. So degrees of freedom is equal to 9 minus 1 is equal to 8. So again, let me just rewrite this here, which is the same as 
Variance is equal to SS over degrees of freedom. So SS is equal to 72 divided by our degrees of freedom, which we just calculated is equal to 8. So 72 divided by 8 gives us a variance of 9. So again, some instances you'll be given SS, others variance, and maybe sometimes standard deviation. So you have to remember how these variables are all related to one another. Next, note that all of the available information that we just noted comes from the sample. Again, we took a sample of nine infants, and those nine infants produced these statistics, which include a sample mean of 13 seconds and a sum of squared deviations equal to 72, which produced a variance equal to 9. So the first step of conducting a hypothesis test using a t-statistic is to state the hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So we'll state the null hypothesis first. And again, going back to the context of this research, we, we um, were told that these infants were um, staring at, a, at these images for 20 seconds. So the null, again, the null in basic terms says there's no difference. So if there's no difference between um, the preferences for an attractive face or um, what was rated as unattractive face, if there's no difference, then we would assume that the infants are spending equal amount of time looking at each of the faces. So equal amount of time would mean that we would half that 20 seconds. So they would spend 10 seconds looking at the attractive face and 10 seconds looking at the uh, um, unattractive face. So the null is going to say there's no difference in the amount of time that they spend staring at these faces given the total time of 20 seconds. So verbally that could be interpreted as the null states um, infants have no preference for either face, right? The differences are the un uh, unattractive and attractive. And in terms of the notation, we would indicate that the mu, since the emphasis is based on the, what the previous researchers had um, theorized, was that the infants prefer attractive faces. So let's use that um, category as kind of the group that represents the untreated population means. So the mu um, time or the average time spent looking at the attractive faces would equal 10 seconds. Again, I said the total amount of time spent looking at the faces was 20 seconds. The null says there will be no difference in the amount of time that they spend looking at either face. Therefore, the no difference would be equated to taking that total time of 20 seconds and splitting it in half. So now we're saying they're going to spend um, 10 seconds looking at the unattractive faces, which is equal to half the amount of time. Next, we're going to state the research hypothesis. And the research says that the infants have a preference for one for one face over the other. So therefore what we would conclude is that the average amount of time spent um, looking at the attractive face if we, we expect there to be a preference for one over the other, then that means more time is going to be allotted to one and less time to the other. So those 20 seconds will not be evenly distributed um, based on those two options. So we would say that the average time that the infants spend looking at the attractive face would not equal 10 seconds. Now the way that this is phrased, um, 
illustrates that we are engaging in a non-directional hypothesis test because even though we're saying that they have a preference for the attractive face, we're not saying that they're going to spend more time looking at the attractive face. Um, just the way that this is stated, it's very broad and we're just saying that um, the amount of time they spent looking at either is going to be equal according to the null. The alternative says that it won't be equal, it will not equal 10 seconds. If it were a one-tailed test, then it would have said that the average time spent looking at the attractive face, let's say, was greater than 10 seconds, lending itself to show that there's a preference for the attractive face. Um, so again, since we didn't use that verbiage that spent more time, um, then we would use this type of notation that is simply the opposite of the null. The null says, equal amount of time for each face. The alternative says it will not be equal. One, one face will get more attention than the other. So that takes care of step one of the four-step process. Next, um, step two indicates we must locate the critical region. So we're going to find what our critical T value is. The critical T value is contingent upon what alpha is equal to, so we need to identify alpha, and then also the identification of whether we're engaging on type 1 or type 2. We've already determined that we're engaging in a 2, not, excuse me, not type 1 or type 2. Scratch that. What I meant to say is whether we're engaging in a directional hypothesis test or non-directional, a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test. So we are engaging in two-tailed test. And again, our critical region, our critical T value is contingent upon our degrees of freedom. So we identified that degrees of freedom was equal to eight in this case because we had a sample size of nine individuals. So in this example, we are actually told that we're going to conduct the hypothesis test using alpha equal to 0 0.05 or 5%. So now we have everything we need to find our critical T value. So critical T is equal to, and since it's a two-tailed test, it's going to be plus or minus a certain number, right, our T value. And we're looking at both sides of the distribution. So again, in the center, our T value would equal zero, no difference. Now we're going to identify what the critical T values are that set the critical region. And to do so, we're going to need to use our T distribution. So here's our T table. Again, we're going to enter it using, enter the table using degrees of freedom. In this case, degrees of freedom was equal to 8. And we are conducting a two-tailed test, so that's the second tier here at 5%, which is identified here, and we're going to see where these values intersect. And they intersect where t is equal to positive negative 2.306. So now we've identified our critical region t value. So we can place this on our slide here. So negative 2.306 positive 2.306. So figure 9.4 illustrates what we just did. Um, so again, given the parameters of using alpha equal to 0 0.05, degrees of freedom equal to 8, we were able to identify the crit critical T values for this hypothesis test. Again, if our T statistic falls in the critical region, we get to reject the null. And if they do not, then we fail to reject the null. Failing to reject the null is saying that there is no treatment effect or there is no difference between the conditions that we are testing. So step three requires that we calculate our test statistic, in this case, our T statistic. So T is equal to M minus mu divided by our estimated standard error of the mean. So this is a little more involved than calculating the test statistics for a Z score because now we have that added step of using the sample statistic, in particular the variance, to calculate 
our estimated standard error before we can actually calculate our t value. So let's begin there. So our estimated standard error is equal to variance over n, and we take the square root of that value. In the previous um, step, or two, two steps prior to this, we did calculate um, our variance when we stated our given values. So again, what was given was SS, sum of square deviations. That was equal to 72. And if you recall, we calculated variance using that value. So variance is SS divided by degrees of freedom. And once we replaced variables, we found that that was equal to 72 divided by 8, and we got 9. So now we can use that value and replace it in this equation. So the estimated standard error of the mean is equal to the square root of 9 over sample size. And that sample size was another given, and it was equal to 9. So 9 divided by 9 is equal take the square root, is square root of 1 is equal to 1. So in this particular example, given the sample statistics generated from the sample mean, um, or the sample I should say, um, generate the estimated standard error of the mean equal to 1. Now we can replace variables in our t equation. So our sample mean, which was also a given, was equal to 13. Mu, this value, may be a, a bit of a challenge for you or, or a question. We weren't given mu um, specifically, but given the information provided in terms of the total time spent looking at the faces, which was 20 seconds, the null, again, based on the, the um, notation we had written for the null in the alternative hypothesis, is equal to 10 seconds. So again, the population mu for what we would often call the untreated group, in this case we're, we're comparing um, different uh, categories and not really administering a treatment, but the mu that illustrates the null is equal to 10 seconds. So again, total time spent looking at the faces equal to 20 seconds. If there's no preference, then they would spend equal amount of time looking at both faces. 20 divided by 2 gives us 10. So they would spend 10 seconds on one face and 10 seconds on the other if there's no preference. No preference means no difference between the two groups as the null states. Then we divide by our estimated standard error of the mean, which in this case uh, was equal to 1. So we have 13 to minus 10 is equal to 3. Divide by 1, and we get a t-statistic equal to positive 3, 3.00. That's our t-statistic. Now we're going to go back to this distribution and see where does that t-value reside in relation to our critical t. So we would conclude that it does fall in the critical region, right? Our critical region t value was equal to 2.306. This is greater than that. And at this point, we, we know what we're going to do with the null hypothesis. And um, so that leads us to our last and final step, which is to draw our conclusions and make a decision regarding the null. So let's use figure 9.4 to see this again. So we came up with a t um, equal to 3.00. We placed that here, right? t equal to 3. Given that it falls in the critical region, we know we get to reject the null hypothesis. So again, step 4 indicates that we make our decision. In this case, our statistical decision is to reject the null right here, right, reject the null because it fell in the critical region, and conclude that babies do show a preference when given a choice between an attractive and unattractive face. Specifically, the average amount of time that the baby spent looking at the attractive face was significantly different. And again, it was um, 
greater, but that's not what we were testing. We were just te testing for a difference between the two. And um, we conclude that they that it was significantly different from the 10 seconds that would be expected if there was no preference. So again, no preference indicated equal time spent on either phase. And now we've concluded that they didn't spend an equal amount of time looking at either phase. They spent a different amount of time looking at the attractive phase opposed to the unattractive phase. As indicated by the sample mean, there is a tendency for the babies to spend more time looking at the attractive faces, um, or the attractive face, excuse me, opposed to the unattractive face. Next, we'll discuss the assumptions of the t-test. These are similar to what we um, were exposed to in Chapter 8. First, the values in the sample are independent observations. That is a, an assumption that we must make in order to engage in a t-test um, when we're testing a hypothesis. Next, the population that is sampled must be normal. And we learned um, that larger samples produce more normal um, distributions. And in Chapter 8, we learned that as long as n is greater than 30, then the distribution of um, t values will also be normal. So the larger the sample, the better, right? Um, so if our original population is skewed, we have to ensure that, that our sample sizes are large, and at least at minimum, larger than 30. If the original population that we're taking our samples from um, is normal, then n can be any size. But now we recognize when we're conducting a t-test that sample size has great implications for the variability of the t distribution as well as um, the, the test that we're engaging in in terms of computing our t statistic. So again, these are assumptions that we must make uh, in order for a hypothesis test to be valid. And so again, I'm going to say n is larger than 30 or um, original population distribution is normal. And before we move into our learning check, I want to review the influences of sample size, mean difference, and variance on your t-statistic as well as your conclusion. So we discussed these relationships in the previous chapter, but we're going to do it again to reinforce that knowledge in this chapter. So again, our t equation is equal to sample mean minus population mean divided by estimate standard error. And our standard error is equal to our standard deviation over the square root of n or variance over n, and we take the square root. Now, as m minus mu increases, again, granted all else is held constant, as um, the difference between m and mu increases, right, as this increases, the, the um, numerator of our equation, the t value increases and the likelihood of rejecting the null increases, right? Because again, that's what we're testing, a difference between the sample mean and the population mean, um, and that is an expression of treatment effect. So if that's larger, then we would anticipate our t-statistic to be larger, larger t-values are further out in the tail, and increase our likelihood of rejecting the null. Now, as um, variability of the sample increases, so that means as e either this increases or this, so again, variability can be denoted by variance or standard deviation, 
As that increases, the numerator, the estimated standard error of the mean equation increases. The estimated standard error of the mean also increases. So this value increases, this increases, and therefore our t value decreases, right? Because if you divide by a larger number, the quotient is going to get smaller. And therefore the likelihood of rejecting the null decreases. Right, so greater variability means that um, the patterns um, that illustrate treatment effect are going to be more blurred because, again, larger variability means a flatter distribution. Flatter distribution means it's harder to detect differences. Um, if we have a, a value out here in the tail, it's really hard to conclude that that difference is due to treatment opposed to the variability that exists already. When we have low variability and it looks like this, if our sample mean is out in the tail, it's, it's more evident that it's due to treatment opposed to the variations that exist in the distribution to begin with. And then finally, if we discuss the relationship of, um, uh, of n on our t value, we can follow the same pattern. So as sample size increases, so again as n increases, that means we're talking about the denominator, right, of these, the, these equations. So as that increases, we again recognize if you divide by a, um, a larger number, this value, the quotient, is going to decrease. So as n increases, the estimated standard error of the mean decreases and t, right, if now this becomes smaller, this becomes smaller, and so if we divide again by a smaller number, again, granted, everything else is being held constant, the t value will increase and likelihood of rejecting the null increases. So again, we've gone through these um, models before in terms of looking at the relationship between variables. And in the end, what we can conclude is that researchers hope for large mean difference, low variability, and um, we can have some effect on those two ideals by increasing sample size. So. The only thing we have control over is the sample size. We have no control over the mean difference, right? That's determined by the treatment, um, if there is one. We have no control over the variability, right, um, that exists in the sample, denoted by variance or standard deviation, which is a function of um, the, which helps create, um, excuse me, the variable or generate the variable estimated standard error. We have no control over that. But what we do have control over is sample size. So again, ideally the researcher wants large mean difference out of our control, but that's what we're hoping for. We want um, low variability, again, out of our control, but the way that we can influence that is to have large samples because larger samples are going to be more representative of the population and um, they'll be more re representative in terms of the variability that exists. So larger samples will be more reflective of the populations from which they came. Um, so again, just recognizing that sample size is, is the only variable that the researchers have control over um, to help us meet these ideals. So we'll end this chapter with a quick learning check. First, when n is small, less than 30, the t distribution, and these are our options, a is almost identical in shape to the normal z distribution, b is flatter and more spread out than the normal z distribution, c is taller and narrower, narrower excuse me, than the normal z distribution, or d cannot be specified making the hypothesis test impossible. 
and if you selected B, you're correct. Again, we learned, um, again, and I talked about this idea of flattening out a, a balloon, um, that a, a T distribution is going to be flatter than a Z distribution when the sample is small. As N increases, and we saw with the T table, as it approaches infinity, it becomes more normal. So larger sample sizes are going to be uh, more reflective and approximate the Z distribution better than smaller samples. Next, the side of the following statements are true or false. First, by chance, two samples selected from the same population have the sample size equal to 36 and the sample mean equal to 83. That means they will also have the same t statistic. So again, our t is equal to m minus mu divided by our estimated standard error of the mean. Each time we select a sample, we have to compute our estimated standard error of the mean, which requires us to know what the sample statistics are. So this value is going to change for our first sample and our second sample. So we would conclude um, that this is a false statement because of this value changes which e with each different sample. Again, we have two samples. Then this value is going to change. And if that value changes, then that means our t values would not be equal. Next, compared to a z-score, a hypothesis test with a t-statistic requires less information about population. Well, we began this ch chapter discussing the um, elements of a z-score and a z-test, um, which says that we must have the population parameters, which include mu and standard deviation of the population. The alternative test is a t-test, or a single sample t-test, and we um, can conduct that test using sample statistics to estimate population parameters. So in the end, we would conclude this statement is true because we need less or require less information to conduct a t-test opposed to a z-test. Z-test requires mu and standard deviation of the population, and that's not required when we conduct a t-statistic. We, um, we need our mu, but we can we use sample statistics as a standard deviation or variance or even SS to estimate um, to estimate our population standard deviation which is unknown. And that concludes this um, part of chapter 9, the introduction to the T statistic. In the next video we'll discuss um, measures of effect. Cohen's D, and I'll introduce um, two new measures of effect uh, for this particular chapter.